Hi, I'm Amy Goodman. You count on Democracy Now! to stay focused on the stories that matter most. We count on you to support our independent journalism. If everyone who tunes in to Democracy Now! signed up for a monthly donation of just $10, we could cover our operating costs for the entire year. Really, that's all it would take. Please do your part today by visiting us at democracynow.org. Stay safe, wear a mask, and thank you so much. From New York, this is Democracy Now! So people tend to think of post-9-11 Islamophobia in terms of hate crimes, in terms of hate speech, in terms of microaggressions. And it's not to say that these things don't exist, but I think it's very important for us to understand that Islamophobia is a structural form of racism that is sustained by empire. Islamophobia and the politics of empire, 20 years after 9-11. We speak with Rutgers professor Deepa Kumar. Then, as the world faces a climate catastrophe, we look at the Ferry Creek blockade in British Columbia, Canada, where nearly 1,000 people have been arrested trying to stop old-growth logging in what's been described as the largest act of civil disobedience in Canadian history. The Ferry Creek blockade is occupying the traditional territory of my matrilineal line. And that obligation that I have to ancestral territories within my family stretches further than environmentalism, stretches further than saving trees. For me, it's talking about and practicing the type of politics that combat the assimilation and the genocide of colonialism in Canada. All that and more, coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. The United Nations warns a million Afghan children could face starvation without immediate international aid after the Taliban completed its sweeping takeover of Afghanistan last month. U.N. Secretary General Antonio Guterres spoke at a high-level U.N. donor conference in Geneva Monday. The people of Afghanistan need a lifeline. After decades of war, suffering and insecurity, they face perhaps their most perilous hour. Monday's donor conference raised $1.2 billion in pledges for Afghanistan. The U.S., which spent over $2.3 trillion during its 20-year occupation and war with Afghanistan, pledged just $64 million in aid. On Capitol Hill, Secretary of State Antony Blinken defended the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan, telling the House Foreign Affairs Committee no one in the Biden administration predicted the Afghan government would collapse while U.S. troops were still in Kabul. During his opening remarks Monday, Blinken said by remaining in Afghanistan, the U.S. military would have only delayed the Taliban's inevitable takeover. There's no evidence that staying longer would have made the Afghan security forces or the Afghan government any more resilient or self-sustaining if 20 years and hundreds of billions of dollars in support, equipment and training did not suffice, why would another year, another five, another ten? Blinken blamed the chaotic U.S. withdrawal on the Trump administration, saying, quote, we inherited a deadline, we did not inherit a plan, unquote. At least two Republicans called on Blinken to resign. Blinken's testifying before the Senate Foreign Affairs Committee today. Coronavirus cases are back on the rise across the United States. More than 1,800 COVID-19 deaths were reported Monday, and the U.S. is confirming an average of more than 170,000 infections a day. That's up from last week, when the Labor Day holiday led to a gap in data about the U.S. outbreak. Here in New York, nearly a million public school students returned to classrooms Monday, most of them for the first time in a year and a half. 
Teachers are required to be vaccinated, though they have until September 27th to get their first shot. In Iowa, a federal judge on Monday issued a temporary restraining order blocking enforcement of a Republican-led ban on mask mandates in schools. The federal judge sided with parents of disabled students, who argued their children were being denied equal access to education since they're at higher risk of COVID-19. In Florida, Republican Governor Ron DeSantis said he will fine city and county governments $5,000 per employee if they impose vaccine mandates. This, as new data shows, child COVID-19 deaths have doubled in Florida since students returned to school, many of them without mask requirements in place. Two prominent scientists who recently retired from the U.S. Food and Drug Administration are blasting the Biden administration's plans to approve third booster doses of COVID-19 vaccines to most U.S. residents. In a scathing critique published in the British medical journal The Lancet, Philip Krauss and Marion Gruber write, quote, Current evidence does not appear to show a need for boosting in the general population, in which efficacy against severe disease remains high. The limited supply of these vaccines will save the most lives if made available to people who are at appreciable risk of serious disease and have not yet received any vaccine, they write. Meanwhile, more than 140 Nobel laureates and former heads of state have signed an open letter calling on Germany to support a waiver of intellectual property rights for COVID vaccines. Their call comes as a World Trade Organization panel is set to convene this week to discuss a patent waiver, nearly a year after India and South Africa proposed the move, which would require the unanimous consent of all 164 WTO member nations. A handful of countries, led by Germany and the United Kingdom, have so far refused to agree to a patent waiver. Joining the call for a people's vaccine is Democratic Congress member Ro Khanna. This issue is uh, so fundamental. If you believe that every uh, human life has dignity uh, and has moral worth, uh, then we need to ensure that everyone ha has access uh, to this vaccine. And a first step to getting people access to the vaccine is making sure that we're sharing the know-how of how they can build it. Meanwhile, a new report contends the Biden administration could unilaterally share the recipe for Moderna's COVID-19 vaccine with the world. Public Citizen says the U.S. Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority, known as BARDA, invested heavily in the development of Moderna's vaccine at taxpayer expense and has access to its entire vaccine recipe. That includes chemistry, manufacturing and controls information that Public Citizen says could be shared with the World Health Organization. Hurricane Nicholas made landfall along the Texas Gulf Coast overnight as a Category 1 storm, bringing 75-mile-per-hour winds and a life-threatening storm surge of up to 5 feet. Forecasters say some parts of the region could see up to 20 inches of rain. There are widespread reports of power outages, with nearly a quarter million Houston-area customers in the dark. Louisiana Governor John Bell Edwards declared a state of emergency, warning his state is still recovering from Hurricane Ida, which struck two weeks ago. Nearly 100,000 customers in Louisiana remain without power after Hurricane Ida. President Biden called Monday for urgent congressional action on the climate crisis during a tour of western states ravaged by wildfires. Biden visited the National Interagency Fire Center in Idaho before traveling on to Northern California, where he joined Governor Gavin Newsom for an aerial tour of damage from the Caldor Fire. Afterwards, Biden called on Congress to pass his $3.5 trillion spending plan, which includes money for a civilian climate corps and other measures to combat the climate crisis. These fires are blinking code red for our nation. But we can't ignore the reality that these wildfire, wildfires are being supercharged by climate change. Climate justice groups seized on Biden's remarks, demanding the White House declare a climate emergency.
Later on Monday, President Biden joined a campaign rally for Governor Newsom, who faces a right-wing recall effort to remove him from office. Polls in the recall election close this evening at 8 p.m. California time. Democrats on the House Ways and Means Committee unveiled legislation Monday that would raise income taxes on the rich and some corporations to pay for most of President Biden's proposed $3.5 trillion spending bill. The tax measure would raise the corporate tax rate from 21 percent to 26.5 percent. It would include a 3 percent surtax on U.S. residents, making over $5 million a year. And it would restore the top rate of nearly 40 percent for high-income individuals and couples. The top capital gains rate would rise to just 25 percent, far short of the nearly 40 percent capital gains tax rate proposed by President Biden and supported by progressives. Speaking to PBS NewsHour, Senate Budget Committee Chair Bernie Sanders said he hoped the Senate would craft a more progressive tax plan. At a time of massive and growing income and wealth inequality, when two people own more wealth than the bottom 40 percent, when the top 1 percent has more wealth than the bottom 92 percent, now is the time to ask the wealthy and large corporations to pay their fair share so that we can begin to address the long neglected needs of working families in terms of our children, in terms of health care, in terms of the elderly, and by the way, in terms of addressing the existential threat of climate change. On Sunday, West Virginia Democratic Senator Joe Manchin insisted again he would not support Biden's $3.5 trillion spending package, calling the price tag too high. Manchin's support is crucial in the Senate, where Democrats have a razor-thin majority. Meanwhile, New York progressive Congressmember Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez campaigned for progressive taxation on the red carpet at Monday's Metropolitan Museum of Art Gala in New York. AOC's white gown featured the words, tax the rich, in prominent red letters along its back. Israeli forces launched a third consecutive night of attacks on the Gaza Strip Monday after rockets were fired toward Israel. The Israeli military claimed it had targeted at least four Hamas sites. Meanwhile, Al Jazeera reports a Hamas spokesperson said the assaults were in response to the escape last week of six Palestinians from an Israeli maximum security prison. Two remain on the run. The Biden administration said Monday it'll withhold about 10 percent of the $1.3 billion in military aid the U.S. gives annually to Egypt, citing concerns over human rights violations. Nearly $1.2 billion of military assistance will continue to flow to Egypt, despite serious allegations of human rights abuses against the government of dictator U.S. ally Abdel Fattah al-Sisi. This comes as advocates are sounding the alarm on the worsening conditions faced by Egyptian activist and blogger Al Abdel Fattah, who was returned to prison in 2019, just six months after being freed following a five-year sentence. Al Fattah reportedly told Egyptian media, quote, My situation is horrible, and I won't be able to continue like this. Get me out of this prison. I will kill myself, he said. Al Fatah was a key leader in Egypt's 2011 uprising. Back in the United States, Capitol Police arrested a man who parked near headquarters of the Democratic National Committee in Washington, D.C., Monday, with a machete and bayonet in his pickup truck. Officers charged 44-year-old Donald Craighead of Oceanside, California, with possession of prohibited weapons. His truck was emblazoned with a swastika and other white supremacist symbols. The arrest came less than a month after Capitol Police arrested a North Carolina man outside the Library of Congress who claimed to have a bomb in his truck. Police are erecting a temporary fence around the Capitol ahead of a far-right pro-Trump so-called Justice for J6 rally planned for this Saturday. Apple has released an emergency software update to fix a security flaw in its iPhones and other products researchers found was being exploited by the Israeli-based NSO group to infect the devices with its Pegasus spyware. Over 1.65 billion Apple products in use around the globe are vulnerable to the spyware since at least March. 
Apple said vulnerable devices could be hacked by receiving a malicious PDF file that users didn't even have to click, known as a zero-click exploit. The flaw was discovered by the University of Toronto's Citizen Lab, which found the hack in the iPhone records of a Saudi political activist. Earlier this year, a massive data leak revealed Pegasus software had targeted the phones of thousands of journalists, activists and political figures around the world for foreign governments and NSO group clients. And a coalition of left-leaning parties is poised to form a new government in Norway after a landslide win Monday that ousted a center-right coalition that's held power since 2013. Labour Party leader Jonas Gahr Stora will become Norway's next prime minister. His coalition includes the Green Party, which campaigned to shut down Norway's oil production within a few years. Stora says his government will focus on dramatic cuts to carbon dioxide emissions to help fight the climate crisis. So we will cut 55 percent of our emissions. That's a huge transition. So we have to really get going during these four, first four years and do that in a tangible way. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. When we come back, Islamophobia and the politics of empire, 20 years after 9-11. We speak with Rutgers professor Deepak Kumar. Stay with us. Is This Where It Ends? by Nabi Haikbal. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman in New York, joined by Democracy Now! co-host Juan Gonzalez in New Brunswick, New Jersey. Hi, Juan. Hi, Amy, and welcome to all of our listeners and viewers across the country and around the world. Well, 20 years ago today, President George W. Bush visited the National Cathedral in Washington to remember the victims of the September 11th attacks. He vowed to, quote, answer these attacks and rid the world of evil, unquote. The U.S. bombing and occupation of Afghanistan would begin less than a month later, beginning 20 years of endless war. According to the Cost of War Project, the wars launched by the United States following 9-11 have killed an estimated 929,000 people in Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iraq, Syria, Yemen and elsewhere. The true death toll may never be known, but the vast majority of the victims have been Muslim. Today we're going to look at Islamophobia, how it has driven U.S. foreign policy and its impact at home. We're joined by Rutgers University professor Deepa Kumar. She's the author of Islamophobia and the Politics of Empire 20 Years After 9-11. It's an updated version of her book, which examined how George W. Bush's so-called War on Terror ushered in a new era of anti-Muslim racism. Professor Kumar, welcome back to Democracy Now! I'm so sorry you have to come back uh, to deal with this issue 20 years after the 9-11 attacks. Now, you do a deep dive into centuries of history going back to Spain. <clears throat> but if you could start off now, in this 20th anniversary of the 9-11 attacks, by talking about what drives the Islamophobia, you say this is about racism, it's not about religious bigotry. <laughs> 
Absolutely right, Amy. And before I get started, I just want to say a huge thank you to you, Juan, and the team at Democracy Now! for doing such important and ethical journalism, especially uh, in troubling times like this. So my argument basically is that it's not enough to understand Islamophobia simply as hate crimes, although hate crimes do exist. It's not enough to understand it as religious intolerance or microaggressions or hate speech and so on, although we do know that all this exists. But to look at the roots of where it comes from, because what happens when you don't do that is that people accept the rhetoric coming from uh, people at the top of society. So Bush argued, for instance, this is not a war on Islam. It's about the extremists. Uh, Obama, who was an extremely sophisticated orator, talked about how Muslims are such a deep part of American society, that Muslim civilizations have contributed to world history and so on. And people accept that rhetoric and don't see how post 9-11 and even before that, there has been a systematic targeting of people who are Muslim. So let me give some examples of how the security establishment works and why uh, deep-seated racism is what drives these policies. So uh, if you look at the FBI's entrapment uh, policy, right, the FBI sends agents provocateurs into Muslim communities to entrap vulnerable people with things like, you know, giving them cash to set up these plots. And of course, immediately after they set it up, they nab them. What's the logic here? The logic is that all Muslims are potential terrorists, and therefore we should nab them before they do anything, right? You look at Obama's uh, counter-radicalization program, the CVE program, and it's about trying to recruit people from the Muslim community, imams, school teachers, uh, coaches, and so on, to spy on their own community. Again, the idea is that there are people in the Muslim community that we should nab before they do anything. Same with the ubiquitous surveillance program, right? Now, there are some people who would say, oh, that's just smart security policy. But if the shoe were on the other foot, I think there'd be howls of anger. Take, for instance, you know, Michael Wade Page, Dylan Roof. These are people who've committed hate crimes. But there's no corresponding, you know, program with the FBI or local police departments to go into white communities and spy on them because they can produce people like this, right? There is no program to entrap them before they do anything. If anything, the Second Amendment rights of far right wing groups of militias and neo Nazis um, are respected. So that's why it's important to see that racism is baked into the security logic of the national security state in the U.S., as well as in terms of how it operates abroad, because if we don't understand where something is coming from, we can't target its roots and therefore dismantle it. Well, Deepa, I wanted to ask you, uh, you go into some of the historical roots of Islamophobia. Most people think it's just a modern phenomenon, but if you could uh, uh, talk a little bit about going back to the earliest days of the construction of the Western empires and uh, uh, going all the way back to uh, uh, Spain uh, during the uh, uh, the first contact, uh, let's say, with the, the New World and, and, uh, and the— um, uh, and the uh, wars then between the uh, uh, the the Muslim world and uh, and the Western world. Absolutely, um, yeah. So a lot of people think of Islamophobia as a post 9/11 phenomenon, but it has a much longer history, both in the U.S. Uh, as well as in Europe. Now, I cut against one argument that this goes back all the way to the Crusades. That's not true. The modern notion of race and of racism actually begins in the uh, 1500s um, and beyond. And the context really is this, which is that Spain emerges, Spain and Portugal emerge as one of the key leading empires in the era of mercantile uh, imperialism. Now, keep in mind, through the bulk of the Middle Ages, right, it is the, it is Muslim empires, it is the Chinese, it is the Indians who are prominent on the world stage, and, you know, Europe is relatively backward. So the idea that you could have, you know, some sort of inferior Muslim race 
be even thought about at the time made no sense when these people had such incredible cultural and political uh, accomplishments. In the early modern era, the Ottomans were seen as the key enemy, but by no means were they racialized as inferior because they were so powerful, right? So in, in many quarters in Europe, they were seen as Europeans as a sort, but nevertheless, as these European nations emerge from what's called the Dark Ages and turn to the oceans, they are battling this powerful land-based uh, empire. Uh, and that's the context in which domestically, as well as uh, internationally, the idea of race comes into being. So uh, there are blood purity laws that start to get used first against Jews and later against Muslims. This is the first sort of biological notion of race. It's the idea that even if you convert from uh, Islam or Judaism to Christianity, your blood was impure. This never used to exist. Earlier in the Middle Ages, if you converted, even if you were considered an enemy, you were accepted as part of the Christian uh, community. That changed quite decisively after 1492, when Jews were uh, expelled and seen uh, as less than, right? But at the same, and this happens to Muslims as well, they are also expelled in the early 17th century. But it's a very nascent form of racism. It's not the full-blown version that we see after the Enlightenment, the philosophical and intellectual movement of the 17th and 18th century. Why? Because it's contradictory. On the one hand, there is this notion that these people are impure and so forth, but not a sense of inferiority because Spain, Portugal, Britain, France have to deal with these powerful North African empires as well as the Ottomans. And so it's very contradictory uh, in that sense. So it's the roots of this notion of, you know, a radical alterity of, of this other, of, uh, you know, Muslims as other, but it doesn't get fully developed until the era of colonialism in the 19th century. Uh, and could you talk as well about the, uh, the roots of Islamophobia in the U.S. before 9-11, especially uh, in the 60s and uh, 70s? Yeah. So, um, Quick history before that, which is that Edward Said talks about Orientalism, which is a body of knowledge which is used to enable European colonialism uh, in North Africa, in the Middle East, in India, right? This composite Oriental is created as a figure to be dominated, to be understood and dominated. Now, some of that language, you know, the U.S. is a settler colonial state based on the movement of, uh, you know, Anglo settlers into the U.S. Some of that seeps in to uh, uh, the U.S. as well. But interestingly, the first major Muslim population to uh, be brought to the uh, U.S. are West African uh, uh, enslaved people who are Muslims. But they were not targeted for their religion. In fact, you know, scholarship shows that they were actually, they occupied a space between black and white because they were educated. Uh, and it's not until the early 20th century that black Muslims are targeted for being Muslims. But to zoom ahead to the period you asked about uh, um, Juan, um, essentially, there are very contradictory notions about Muslims, about Arabs, and so on, all the way up until the uh, Second uh, World War. That's when the U.S. replaces France and Britain as one of the key imperial powers in, the North, uh, in North Africa, in the Middle East, in South Asia, and elsewhere. And that's when you start to see a process by which uh, first Arab Americans are created as terrorist threats, and then uh, Iranians after the Iranian revolution, and then South Asians. And the particular moment that scholars point to is the uh, Munich incident of 1972, when a Palestinian group takes Israeli athletes hostage, and in the case, uh, and in the context of a rescue attempt, murders all of them. And this is, you know, a really grisly event that's covered by the media worldwide. What happens in the U.S.? Nixon actually now sees all Arab Americans as responsible for the Munich incident and begins programs of surveillance, such as Operation Boulder, which is modeled on the infamous COINTELPRO. And from then on, 
the idea that this is a suspect population, that these are potential terrorists, has been the way in which the security establishment has functioned. So now let's take it to 9-11. <clears throat> and I wanted to use one story that sort of illustrates what happened right after, um, the remarkable story of Salman Hamdani. He was a Pakistani New York City police cadet who died on September 11, 2001, after he raced to ground zero to try to save lives at the World Trade Center. Even though Salman was singled out by former President Bush and mentioned by name in the Patriot Act as a hero, the New York Post and other right-wing media outlets falsely claimed he was a possible terrorist on the run. The Post ran an article headlined, Missing or Hiding? Mystery of NYPD Cadet from Pakistan. His remains were later found at Ground Zero. On the eve of the second anniversary of the World Trade Center attacks, on September 11, 2003, I interviewed his mom, Talat Hamdani. Three days before going to Mecca. And then the day we were leaving, uh, these rep reporters came home, you know, first the New, New York Post guy came home, and then short, shortly later, you know, the Daily News guy came, and then I think the Newsday. So I asked them, you know, why are you all here again? Now what happened? It was a month later, October 11th. So I said, what happened? What brings you back to our house? So they told us there's a flyer circulating amongst the NYPD with your son's cadet picture on it. If anyone has seen him to come forward, we need some information about him. And then we left for Mecca, and when we, we were there, we, my sisters told us that, you know, this is what the newspaper, the Post printed a very horrible heading, you know, missing or hiding, and amongst the, uh, the news that the way they presented it, it had, you know, uh, insinuations that he was seen near the, uh, at 11 a.m. he was seen near the Midtown Tunnel, and is he really hiding? Most probably, is he really missing? He's not missing, but he's hiding, and he could be one of the terrorists. I have that article. And so what came of this? missing or hiding, suggesting that he was a terrorist. What did the authorities do then? And how did you feel? The authorities, what authorities? Who would take action? Who do you think should take action against the newspaper? You tell me. So, <clears throat> that is the mother of uh, Talat Hamdani, the mother of Salman Hamdani. So, let's use that as a way to talk about what happened after 9-11. Not only the attitude to Muslims in the United States, but the whole shaping of U.S. foreign policy, the attacks on Afghanistan and Iraq and beyond. Well, thank you for, you know, bringing to light stories like this. It was mostly activists in New York City and around the area who were involved in defense campaigns um, around, you know, people who were just disappeared, thrown into jail, not allowed to talk to a lawyer even, uh, not allowed to speak to their family. And it's so important to talk about the thousands of people who've been detained, imprisoned, or deported, uh, to see the full force of what actually happened, based on the presumption that you're guilty. Just because you're Muslim, you're guilty, and then you have to, you know, be proven uh, innocent. This logic is called preemptive prosecution. But on the international stage, um, essentially what the U.S. did is that the war in Afghanistan, which was the first sort of, you know, intervention to uh, in the war on terror, it was sold not simply as uh, we've got to go root out terrorism and get Osama bin Laden and all the rest of it, but it was sold to the U.S. public as rescuing Afghan women. Now, there's no doubt that women in Afghanistan, particularly in the, in the cities, had suffered tremendously under the Taliban regime. But this was not newsworthy. A study I did with a colleague found that the broadcast news media, you know, television, radio, and so on, barely dedicated, you know, a couple of dozen stories in the year before 9-11. Uh, but all of a sudden, when people like Laura Bush, when Colin Powell are all talking about how the war on terror 
is also a war to liberate women and for human rights and so forth, you start to see tremendous media coverage, right? 900-something stories in a matter of a few months. And unfortunately, feminist organizations also signed on to the war on terror. And colleagues of mine in women and gender studies departments also uh, have noted how, uh, you know, people gave their consent to what was going to be 20 years of a horrible situation for uh, all people in Afghanistan, but also for women. We know, of course, that women were not liberated uh, in Afghanistan. And the resources you mentioned earlier in the program, Amy, uh, the trillions that were spent, 90 percent of that went towards militarism and 10 on infrastructure and uh, 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 nation building. Sure, some things improved, such as education and healthcare in the city centers, but for the vast majority of people, 70% of Afghans live in the countryside. They were thrown from the frying pan into the fire because the U.S. allied itself with Mujahideen warlords. These were the people that the U.S. trained uh, back in the 1980s to fight the uh, Soviet Union. Those were the people who then uh, came to power. So. The war on terror was sold to the American public using Orientalist and racist ideas that these societies are backward. They don't value their women, so we must go in and liberate them. Or in the case of Iraq, when no weapons of mass destruction were found, um, it was we should bring democracy. Never mind, of course, that we don't we don't have a very good form of democracy right here in the U.S., and that women continue to fight even today to hold serial rapists and harassers accountable in our court system. And yet this white man's racist argument, white man's burden argument, was the one that was mobilized for U.S. intervention around the world. And Deepa, I wanted to ask you, you mentioned it earlier, uh, the... Uh, the the role of Iran uh, it, uh, and the its use the, the use of the national security state of Iran as this uh, uh, Muslim extremist uh, uh, boogeyman uh, that I mean obviously Iran is a very large country over 80 million people has has for decades now resisted being controlled by the European powers. Uh, how is that used uh, to continue to foment uh, Islamophobia? Absolutely. So I mentioned earlier, Juan, how it was the Arab terrorists that was the first in this process of germination, the, germinating this notion that, you know, brown people from this area are threats. But after the Iranian revolution and particularly the hostage crisis where personnel in the U.S. embassy were taken hostage for 444 days, um, that became a key turning point in the vocabulary in the U.S. and in the development of the idea of an Islamic threat, right, of an Islamic uh, terrorist. And the reason it was portrayed in this fashion is because a U.S.-backed dictator, the Shah, was overthrown not by an Islamic movement, but by a people's movement, right, workers going on strike, women college students, poets, intellectuals, religious minorities, all who rebelled against the Shah's iron rule, iron fist, if you, if you will. And ultimately, Khomeini comes to power and takes over. But that's the framework that's used, is that this is a move back to the Middle Ages. These people are just so backward, they can't deal with the modernizing reforms that the Shah had forced on people. Um, and therefore, you know, it, it's a huge threat to modernization, modernity, and the U.S. Uh, must see Iran from then on as this enemy and as the font of, uh, you know, uh, Islamic terrorism. So let me ask you about what's happening now, the kind of uh, reflection, if there is any, over the last 20 years, and what this means for Muslims in the United States and around the world. Uh, you had yesterday uh, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken testifying before the House Foreign Affairs Committee, defending President Biden's decision to withdraw from Afghanistan. But the way they put it was—he put it was basically, you know, we inherited a timeline from Trump. This is his fault and we had to move forward with that. And there's been a lot of criticism of the chaotic last few weeks as the U.S. pulled out. 
Um, but that seems to be replacing a reflection on what took place over this 20 years, a, a call for an inquiry into these last few weeks. But what about the last 20 years and what this war has meant, not to mention, uh, two years later, um, President Bush bombing Iraq? Um, <clears throat> Can you talk about what this has meant and what a different kind of analysis would lead to? Yeah. So let me start by saying that there are people within the foreign policy establishment who are drawing the conclusion that U.S. occupation of Afghanistan, of Iraq, has been a total disaster, right? These have been defeats for the U.S., both in Iraq as well as uh, in Afghanistan. So that model of establishing imperial hegemony is one that was already shelled, right, by uh, Obama, but that increasingly has become a bipartisan consensus is that you can't go in in the way the U.S. did in Japan or in Germany and remade those societies in ways that fit in with the U.S.'s uh, global geopolitical um, order. So that lesson has been drawn um, by, uh, you know, certainly sections of the political elite. And what's going on is a blame game, right? It's, you know, it was, it was uh, Trump's fault, there was no plan. Um, and, and so forth. And the question is, that's not being asked is, why did the U.S. go in uh, in the first place? And questioning, uh, you know, whether empire, whether colonialism, this was colonialism, whether colonialism is justifiable. All that said, the war on terror is not over, and I don't think that we should act like it's over. Um, at least since the uh, mid-2000s, when Obama put out his posture of the pivot to Asia, there's been a desire to have less resources targeted at so-called terrorists uh, around the world, with a focus instead on China that is seen as a key threat to U.S. interests on the global stage. And various administrations, right, have tried to, uh, you know, uh, scale back, but that has uh, not been uh, possible. But the war on terror is going to continue nevertheless, but it's going to take a different form. There are now anywhere between 800 and 1,000 military bases, U.S. military bases around the world. And it's from these bases that drone strikes are possible, right? These drone strikes are not things that we know about. They just happen and very often, as recently happened in Afghanistan, innocent people uh, are killed. So that's going to be the muscle power, along with special operations forces, as Biden and others have already uh, admitted. Um, and so... Unfortunately, that puts us in a situation where it's no longer going to be dramatic and therefore covered by uh, the media. And people will somehow think that all the persecution of uh, uh, Muslims, both domestically or internationally, has ended. You mentioned the figure from the Cost of War project. I just want to say of the number of dead uh, because of the uh, war on terror. And I just want to you know, say that that study says direct war violence. Right? It does not include um, deaths due to the destruction of infrastructure, deaths that are not counted uh, in official statistics, as uh, Anand Gopal points out in a really great piece in The New Yorker, which is from the point of view of Afghan women, um, that the deaths in the ones and twos in Afghanistan are typically not counted in official statistics, which is why somebody like Molalai Joya, who you've had on this program, puts the death at over one million. So all of that is going to be papered over, unfortunately, as the U.S. continues its counterterrorism uh, policies. Um, and I'll end with this, which is that we know also that between 2018 and 2020, the U.S. was conducting counterterrorism operations in 85 countries around the world. That's practically half the world. And so terrorism has become a very useful way to establish U.S. hegemony and control on the global stage. So I do think that there's going to be more attention on China, but at the same time, the war on terror is far from over.
Deepa Kumar, we want to thank you so much for being with us, scholar and activist, author of Islamophobia and the Politics of Empire, 20 Years After 9-11, the first edition of the book published in 2012. Uh, Professor Kumar uh, teaches media studies at Rutgers University. Coming up, as the world faces a climate catastrophe, we look at the Ferry Creek blockade in British Columbia, where nearly a thousand people have been arrested. It's being described as the largest act of civil disobedience in Canadian history. Stay with us. Spirit of the Wind by Buffy St. Marie and Tanya Tagak. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. As the world faces a climate emergency, we turn now to Canada, which had the hottest summer in its history this year. Wildfires burned across the West Coast, from California to British Columbia, where a record-breaking heat dome killed at least 800 people in a single week. Climate change policy has become a central issue in the lead-up to next week's Canadian federal election. Meanwhile, tensions rising between police and environmental and First Nation activists who are staging a months-long anti-logging resistance to protect the ancient forests of Vancouver Island, which is just off the coast of Vancouver, north of Washington State and Seattle. The protest's been underway for two years. It's now one of Canada's largest acts of civil disobedience. Land defenders with the Ferry Creek blockade are calling on others to join them to save the remaining trees, which are hundreds of years old with some estimated to be more than a thousand years old among the oldest on the planet. Not only is it really important to protect these trees currently, um, but from industry coming in, invading unceded territories on Pashidat and Dididat land, where they're stealing and natural resources from indigenous people. Um, but we also need it for the old growth because they have the most water intake that they can hold that actually helps climate change and prevent forest fires. And we need that more than ever right now. As the Ferry Creek blockade has grown in the past four months, Canadian police have arrested nearly 1,000 activists, often beating and pepper spraying the land defenders. Police are now in court pushing for greater enforcement powers of an injunction that bans blockades in the area. For more, we're going to Victoria, British Columbia, um, and we're going to Katie George Jim, an indigenous land defender who joined the Ferry Creek blockade last September, has been arrested numerous times. Welcome to democracy now. And, Katie, I was wondering if you can start off—I just didn't want to mispronounce your given name—by talking about your matrilineal and patrilineal lineages and how that informs what you're doing, why you're there at the Ferry Creek blockade. Yeah. Good morning, Icequachel. My given name is Huishuacha. And on my matrilineal side, I come from Sook, Pachidat, and Lekwungen territories, which is located on what is now known as Southern Vancouver Island. And on my patrilineal side, I'm related to Hsaitnich and Penelicate uh, territories. And both of those are Coast Salish and on my mother's side, related to Neutronis territories, where Ferry Creek blockade is taking place, um, which is considered Neutronis territory on the west coast of the island. And that recognition and acknowledgement, as well as the practice um, of introducing yourself in that way, uh, 
calls forth that responsibility to the territories um, where your ancestors um, have taken care and related to those territories. And so that's no different today um, for the land uh, where the blockade is taking place. And, and Katie, you have said that this is not just an issue of saving the trees, but it is also uh, an issue of the inherent rights of indigenous people. Could you talk about that further? Yeah. Um, on the coast, uh, we have a long history of asserting ourselves as coastal people where our inherent right is not only based in our relationship to our communities, but is based on our relationship and our legal systems in and with the land. And so this type of worldview and this type of framework of society is, from my perspective, what will inform the type of climate action and the necessary political action um, to have a future worth protecting. And so when we talk about the trees or when we talk about environmentalism, often we leave out the intricacies and the complexities of what it means to address settler colonialism, what it means to address racism and all of these systemic and structural issues that we face as Indigenous people who have been targeted since the occupation of the British crown and the Canadian state and unceded, unsurrendered indigenous territories. And so how that relates to sovereignty or inherent rights as indigenous people is that it's not only an assertion of that right when we talk about um, what it, the decision-making process um, is for the people and the land, but also what we are fighting for is the future generations and our past ancestral relationships to those places. And so our indigenous laws here are place-based, our knowledge systems and legal systems and societal and economic systems are, st are also based within that understanding of the world. Katie, and so and for me- Oh, go ahead. Yeah. No, for, for me, it's it's that time is relative and me at this point also have to carry forward those laws and be informed by that action. I wanted to go to the end of May, uh, when the Royal Canadian Mounted Police arrested several land defenders protesting the logging of the old-growth forests at the Kekus camp. One of those arrested was you, Katie George Jim. You can be heard in this video saying, I cannot breathe. I cannot breathe. Get on the ground. Get down on the ground. I cannot f***ing breathe. Do hey, not touch let me. Let go of her. Right now. Do not touch let me. Let go of her. Do you see this type of violence that's being used around Let go of her now. Get down on the ground. Let go. You get down on the ground. Do you get see what you're doing here? You you're are obstructing me. Justice. I have not obstructed yeah, anyone. You're not obstructing any justice. You're not breathing. How do you know I've obstructed so anybody? No. So, Katie George Jim, if you can describe that scene, but also the entire blockade, um, for people who aren't even familiar with what might be the largest civil disobedience in Canadian history, how is it organized? How are people sleeping, eating? What are the community spaces? Is this similar, for example, to the mass protests in North Dakota in 2016, the protest against the building of DAPL, the Dakota Access Pipeline? Yeah, well, I actually haven't heard that clip for a really long time. Um, and that was at the beginning of enforcement um, on the unceded territory of the Dididat Nitnat people in Neutronet's territories. And that's uh, my, uh, not my direct lineage or ancestral territory, but as a sovereign Indigenous person, I believe that's what I was also talking a lot about in that clip while I was being forcibly removed from Indigenous land was that the RCMP had no jurisdiction on, on stolen land. The police have no jurisdiction, and industry don't have jurisdiction on stolen land. And within that, we also talk about um, the jurisdiction of the, per, the province or the federal government. 
And for those that are unfamiliar within Canada, Canada is a constitutional monarchy where the federal government, for instance, is technically obligated to interface with what is known as uh, Indian bands. And those are still today used to uh, segregate and oppress Indigenous people within their own lands, whether it's on the reserves or within the foster care system, which has previously been compared to the residential school system. It is a continuation of. And so when we talk about what is happening at Ferry Creek, when we talk about these arrests, we can't forget to talk about the history that has and will continue to inform these types of civil disobedience, these types of direct action that is being taken to protect the land from industries like Teal Jones, from colonial governments like the BC and DP and the federal liberals. We talk about what folks as settler people, but also Indigenous people and Black and other people of colour within communities are willing to go through to be in relationship to land. And with Ferry Creek, um, a lot of the communities whether that is the community that is present at a blockade or Indigenous communities that are surrounding the territory. It is actually quite, it's very high tension. It is, it is a very politically strained situation where communities of uh, loggers or communities of, of Indigenous families that are stuck in mutual benefits agreements or revenue sharing agreements. And then we have Indigenous community members and families like myself and my relations who are also showing up at these blockades. And with settler people, um, specifically white settler people who have no concept or understanding of those complexities, it makes it an interesting, to say the very least, um, type of dynamic that you enter in. And so a, a community uh, uh, camp. Katie, uh, if we can, I want to bring in Noah Ross, who's an attorney representing uh, many of the land defenders at Ferry Creek. Uh, uh, welcome to Democracy Now! Noah, I, I wanted to ask you, could you talk about the, um, the, the British Columbia Supreme Court injunction against the protesters on Vancouver Island? What powers does it grant uh, the logging company involved here, Teal Jones Group? Yes, hello. Uh, thank you, Juan. And uh, yeah, I'm honored to be on the show and uh, to be on uh, with you, Katie. Um, so the injunction that was granted uh, to Teal Jones, it, it prohibits uh, blocking of logging activities within a, a large area of several hundred square kilometers in southern, what's now known as southern Vancouver Island. Um, it doesn't prohibit people from being there it just prohibits blocking logging so um there have been yeah as katie's been talking about there's been individual hundreds or thousands of people have been trying to stop uh that logging from taking place um but it doesn't prohibit people from from being there so there's been a, a kind of ongoing battle waged on a variety of fronts between the rcmp who have been trying to keep uh land defenders out uh of the area um, to try to quell resistance. And what about the uh, the tactics used by the police and is, and especially the uh, the Mounties so, uh, in terms of the protesters? Yeah, it's been hugely concerning from uh, from a legal perspective. There has been, uh, you know, like I said, there's people have the right to peacefully protest, but. And the police, ostensibly, uh, should just be arresting people who are violating the the injunction um, by blocking logging activities. But they've gone beyond that. There's been targeting of of uh, BIPOC Indigenous people, like like in the, video, the clip you showed of Katie. I think there's been uh, many many instances where uh, people of color have been specifically targeted. Um, also, there's the RCMP have been using exclusion zones, which is something that was also used on was against Wet'suwet'en land defenders last year, and that's where they just block access on a logging road to sometimes 
you know, hundreds of kilometers of further logging road and all the territory that's that behind that. Um, so people then need to hike around or face arrest for trying to walk through. Um, there's been a lot of violence used against people that are defending, like that are nonviolently attaching themselves to uh, the road or to tripods with sleeping or with sleeping dragons. And uh, Noah, we're going to have to leave it there, but we will continue to cover this issue. Noah Ross, attorney for land defenders at Ferry Creek Blockade, and Katie George Jim, indigenous land defender. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Stay safe.